right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Please turn to Second Corinthians chapter two. Second Corinthians chapter two. And uh, if you allow me just a few moments, I got saved at the North Shore Church building in 1968. I was eight years old, so um, I'm very much familiar with the ministry there at North Shore and uh, the influence that Pastor J.C. O'Hare had. And uh, when uh, a few months ago I went to uh, negotiate and, and pick the pulpit up, uh, I had the opportunity to just sort of tour the old building, and uh, all of these memories just began to flood. I went to the school, Stewart School, behind the church building, and I remember some of the rooms that we met in and played in and had fun in and so on and so forth. So it was uh, just a delight to see the old neighborhood, to see the old building, and, uh, of course, the most important thing is the, uh, uh, the fruit of the ministry there. Uh, the message of the grace of God that has been uh, proclaimed over the years. So anyway, uh, it is... You know, I, uh, yeah, when I was a little kid, I remember, uh, you know what, I was actually looking for that pew. Uh, as a kid, I took a paper clip and I scratched my name on one of the pews. And the, uh, the gentleman that was uh, sort of leading me around the building again, I said, hey, you know, can I just check some of these pews out? And he was wondering, what in the world is this guy doing? And I was trying to find the pew that I scratched my name in, and I couldn't find it. But, yeah, I, I left my mark there at North Shore Church. And, unfortunately, it was the, uh, the scratched-up pulpit. So, hey, I got saved there. My sister got saved there. And my mother got saved there. So, of course, uh, that's the most important memory uh, that I have in the ministry. All right, here we go. Second Corinthians Chapter 2, the title for my message this morning is Life Stinks. And interestingly enough, I think I've had more reaction over a t this title than I've had uh, with some of my past titles. I've had people say, Amen. I've had people say, Isn't that the truth? Uh, I've had people say, uh, I can relate to all of that. And I had one brother with a concerned look on his face. He asked, uh, Does that mean your message is going to stink? <laughs> Perhaps. I don't know. But uh, I hope you understand why I'm going to title this lesson, Life Stinks. It actually does come out of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's read the passage, and then we're going to move on. I'm going to begin reading here at verse 12 and read right on down through verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning there at verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place." For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Let's pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for your love, for your grace. We pray now that our time, our moment here in your word would be edifying, may it be impactful, uh, may it be sobering, and may it also be encouraging. And Father, we do thank you for this time in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. When Paul here talks about this savor of knowledge, you notice there in verse 14, and then in verse 15, he talks about, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. Verse 16, to the one we are the savor of death. That word savor is just an old English word that carries with it the idea of the smell, the aroma, the scent. So Paul is using language to describe his ministry in a way that uh, strikes this image of a fragrance or odor that's being emitted. And obviously it seems rather peculiar here. Why is he all of a sudden using language in reference to smell and odor and fragrance? Well, if we understand what's happening here, we'll better appreciate why Paul is using this kind of language. Now, before we start, uh, every commentary that I went to, just to sort of get an idea of what is being said about this passage, all the commentaries I found 
insist that what Paul is doing here is using the Roman triumph as a way of illustrating his ministry. Now, if you don't understand what this Roman triumph is all about, historically, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, when the Romans would conquer other nations, when Rome would defeat other peoples, they would have, of course, days of festivities, and they had their version of providing video coverage of the conquest. Obviously, they didn't have video, correct? So this is what the Roman Empire would do. They would invade a uh, pagan country. They would conquer that country. And what they would do is they would have a parade. And in the parade, they would march uh, through the streets of Rome or through uh, any one of the streets of a Roman city. And the citizens of the city would congregate and they would witness this parade. And in this procession, they would have scale models of some of the buildings and temples and monuments of the territory that they conquered. They would parade uh, some of the agriculture. They would parade some of the industrial equipment. They would parade uh, some of the animals. So the Roman citizens, they got a feel and an idea of, well, who did we just conquer? Uh, what was there? Was it worth the battle? Was it worth the blood that was shed? And they got a real video as it were, visual image of the conquered lands and peoples. And so they would enjoy the parade and they would say, hey, look at those kinds of animals. Look at those kinds of, of fruits and vegetables and foods and so on and so forth. According to tradition, at the end of this procession, Rome would now parade the people that was conquered. And according to tradition, you would have those peoples that were now defeated, that were now the savor of life unto life. That is, supposedly these people would carry this type of incense. And as these conquered people were marching in the parade, they were emitting this type of an incense that uh, typified a new life, a life of slavery. But then, after this group of people that were going to enter a new life of slavery, you had the condemned. You had prisoners of war. And these prisoners of war, they too carried supposedly some kind of incense that emitted this odor. And these condemned prisoners were going to be executed. Hence, their smell was death unto death. Now, I'm, I don't believe that's what Paul's doing here. I just want to share with you what is commonly traditionally taught about verses 14 through verse 17. Look there at verse 14. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to what? Triumph in Christ. You see, Paul is borrowing from this Roman festivity, this Roman parade of the conquered. And you have those that are going to become slaves, life unto life, and those that are going to die, death unto death. I don't believe that's what Paul is saying. Now, uh, perhaps Paul is making a reference to the Roman triumph. But there is a slight problem. You see, traditionally, people interpret that Paul is talking about the recipients that are either emitting an odor of life or the recipients that are emitting an odor of death. But, you know, Paul's not talking about how the recipient is smelling. Paul's talking about how he is smelling. Look there at verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Look at verse 16. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death. You see what Paul is saying here? He's not saying the conquered are the ones that are smelling. He's saying, I'm the one that smells a certain way to two different categories of people. 
Verse 16, to the one, we are the savor or smell or scent of death unto death. And to the other, the savor or the smell of life unto life. Paul is using this image to typify the two types of responses to his message and to his ministry. To one group of people, they smell the sweet, fragrant aroma of life. But to the other, all they smell is the putrid stench of death. That's the type of ministry that Paul is conducting and the type of response that he is receiving. Now, how do we know that that is really what Paul is emphasizing here? You know, it all begins there at verse 12. Look there at verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was open unto me of the Lord... I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now understand what Paul is doing in 2 Corinthians is he's defending his apostleship. And he's defending his apostleship against those who are ungrateful for his apostleship. In other words, by the way, 2 Corinthians is the most passionate, most emotional epistle that Paul writes. I mean, you can just see the emotion dripping from his pen. He's dealing with erring and ungrateful people. And he provides some of the strongest arguments in defense of his apostleship here in this second letter to the Corinthians. And these Corinthians, sadly, they are not appreciating what Paul is doing. They're not appreciating what he's teaching. They're not appreciating the life-giving gospel that he was entrusted with. And there are a series of accusations now that are being made about the Apostle Paul. We're not going to look at it all, but you understand that Paul in 2 Corinthians, he's being accused of being fickle. He's accused of being authoritarian. He's accused of lacking credibility. He's accused of walking in the flesh. He's accused of being weak. He's accused of being presumptuous. He's accused of being jealous. He's accused of being undignified. He's accused of being a flat out liar. So you understand why Paul's really passionate here. And Paul, he says, uh, okay, uh, Allow me to be a fool, he says in chapter 11. I'll take the gloves off you, Corinthians. You have forced me to do something I don't want to do. And that is to defend my God-given apostleship and appointment as the apostle of the Gentiles. So one of the accusations that is now being hurled against Paul is, Paul, you're a coward. You're a defeated coward who threw in the towel and waved the white flag of surrender. Notice there in verse 14, uh, verse 12. When I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was open unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I found out Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. He's he's going to explain why. He cut short a ministry of evangelistic opportunity there in Troas because there's something stirring in his spirit. He's being accused of bailing out. He's accused of of abandoning his duty. Why, Paul, did you leave? Now, go to chapter 7, and he's going to say something else about uh, what's happening. And, and by the way, historically, it's all recorded in Acts chapter 20. Okay, keep that in mind for a second. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and look there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 5. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side without were fightings within were fears. There's something about Macedonia that we want to keep in mind here. Macedonia was not the area of Paul's greatest success. Okay? Now, he's talking about Acts 20, but 
let's just go back a little bit earlier in history and just sort of capture what is this about Macedonia. Go to chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, we, we read something about his history there in Macedonia. In Acts chapter 16, look there at verse 12, Acts 16 verse 12. Acts 16, verse 12, and from thence to Philippi, which, well, uh, well, from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. Okay, so he's he's in the chief city of Macedonia. Okay, he's going to conduct ministry there. And, uh, and keep in mind that he goes to Philippi, okay? He goes to Philippi. It's the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony, a Roman colony, right? And we were in that city abiding certain days. So now what happens while he is there in Macedonia? If you drop down to verse 22, look there at verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So here's Paul ministering in Macedonia, and he's not getting a very kind welcome. He's being beaten. He's being beaten with many stripes. He's thrown into the jail cell. His feet are now in the stocks, which, by the way, his feet now are swelling, if you understand what they did. And the whole story of the Philippian jailer. Macedonia was an area that that Paul had some of the greatest rejection. If you go to Philippians, now now look there in Philippians chapter 4. Remember, he did go to the principal city there in Macedonia. And if you go to Philippians chapter 4, and, and, and might as well go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Go to Philippians chapter 4, and then 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And, and Paul's going to comment about his experiences there in Macedonia. Notice there in, let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and notice there in verse 2, 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. You, you see how Paul, he, it's in the back of his mind. Shamefully entreated. Number one. He's not going to start writing about his great victory and success. He's going to recall the rejection, the shameful treatment. And notice what he says to the Philippians in chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And notice there in verse 15. In Philippians chapter 4, verse uh, 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from... Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. You know what Paul is saying right there? No other church helped me out. Listen, you have the public, you have the citizenry, you have the masses that are rejecting Paul. They're reacting violently against Paul. They apprehend Paul. There is the legal right to beat them, to whip them with stripes. They throw them into the jail cell and they hold fast their feet. And Paul says, I was shamefully entreated and not one church, not one church stepped forward and provided any financial aid so I can retain a lawyer, so I can deal with the problem. You know what Paul is trying to communicate here? Even the churches are starting to bail out on me. Even the churches are beginning to reject me. Even the churches of Macedonia, they're turning on me. Now, praise the Lord. Verse 15 says, there was one church, however, that did provide some financial relief. And that was the Philippian assembly, right? 
So I just sort of get that in your framework. Go back to Second Corinthians. Uh, all I want to do is, is just sort of press and highlight that, listen, as Paul is conducting his ministry there in Macedonia, he, he, he's having some problems, not only from the unsaved Macedonia, but he's also having problems with who? The other churches that don't even want to help me out anymore. Things aren't looking real well, is it? So in light of all of that, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit because I found out Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. He's going right back to the territory that he found most of the problems and difficulties. And he even said, without were fightings and within were what? Fears. Okay. So... What is it that Paul now says in verse 14? Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to what? To to triumph. Paul, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You talk about a paradox. Go over to chapter 1. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. Does it sound like he's having a highly successful ministry where the, uh, uh, the advancing hordes of darkness are responding positively to his claims? This sounds like an absolute failure. He sounds like a big zero. Go over to uh, chapter uh, four. Look, chapter four, real quickly. Second uh, Corinthians, chapter four. Why is it that Paul emphasizes and repeats over and over in writing this epistle? Look at how I am suffering. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse 7, But we have this treasure in an earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Look at verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 4. Chapter 6, verse 4, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience. How? In afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labor. And you keep going down that list, right? Go to chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 23, chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often of the Jews five times received I, forty stripes save one. Trice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, trice I suffered shipwreck. Paul, he is now beginning to recount and categorize all of the types of sufferings that he is experiencing. Chapter 12, he does it again. Chapter 12. And, and notice what he says there in verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. Listen, Paul, he is now trying to present himself as a poster child of God's official spokesman. I I am God's man. I am the apostle of the Gentiles and I am suffering. And yet he says, but I'm always triumphing. Go back to chapter two again. Now, wait a minute. Paul, remember, even if we be beside ourselves, (laughs) Paul, what kind of crazy talk is this? How in the world can someone who is suffering as severely and as intensely as the apostle Paul actually say in chapter 2, verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Now in light of that, he's now going to press upon the Corinthians. There are two responses out there. And by the way, the Corinthians now are beginning to adopt 
the response that he is experiencing from the world. He says in verse 16, to the one, we are the savor of death unto death. You know what the world sees and what the world is concluding when they see what is happening to Paul? Death. They smell the rotting, putrid stench of waste. Who is this guy? Oh, to live a life of absolute futility. What are you doing? All of your time, all of your talent, all of your resources vested in a dead God, vested in a superstition, in some myth about a dead Jew supposedly walking out of a tomb. Paul, your life is a testimony of sheer death and utter futility. And what you're doing is literally leading people to join in a life of absolute worthlessness, of absolute waste, of absolute futility. You see, Paul is saying, I'm the one who is emitting this odor and the world, they smell the stench of repulsive rottenness. Who is this guy? You know, go to Genesis chapter 30. In Genesis chapter 30, the idea of stinking. And by the way, this is a matter of perspective, right? In the eye, in the nostrils of the world, when they evaluate the life of the Apostle Paul, in the nostrils of the world, when they try to measure the work and the ministry of Paul, what do they smell? What a waste. Death. Rottenness. That idea of being a stink to the world. Go to Genesis chapter 30. Uh, chapter 34, rather. I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 34. And verse 30, Genesis chapter 34, and notice there in verse 30, Genesis chapter 34, verse 30. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, now Jacob, Simeon and Levi are Jacob's sons, okay? And here's the problem. Simeon and and Levi, they have a sister. She was raped. She was raped by some uncircumcised pagan inhabitant of the land. And so this prince who raped their sister, he says, I've got to marry this woman. And so Jacob, he enters into a political economic agreement with these uncircumcised heathen. But now Simeon and Levi, they're outraged, number one. Our sister was raped at the hands of an uncircumcised heathen and dad Why are you entering into some ungodly relationship with the uncircumcised inhabitants? So verse 30, and Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me and I shall be destroyed and uh, I and my house. Jacob's panicking, right? You know what these Gentiles are going to do? They're going to retaliate, you idiots. They're going to they're going to kill me. But do you notice how he describes? I'm now going to be a stink to these people. The object of their hate, the object of their scorn, the object of their vengeance against me. Paul's using language about the stench of death in relationship to what? My life in your midst, you Corinthians. My message and ministry in the midst of humanity. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and that's exactly why we know that Paul is talking about how he smells. And the world thinks, man, you're a smelly man. or You stink. You're the object of our hate and scorn. You're repulsive to us. When Paul goes around preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the world, they're repulsed by it. They're offended by that message. So here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, have you ever wondered, look there at verse 12, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 12. So then death worketh where? 
You see that? I'm the smell of death. I walk around. I conduct my ministry. And, and, and all the world smells is rotten stench. So then death worketh in us. But notice what Paul says. Life in you. Life stinks in the nostrils of the world. Life is smelly. And when we represent our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully preaching the claims of Almighty God, Christ Jesus dying for the sins of the world, Jesus Christ dying for sinners and buried and raised from the dead to give eternal life, the world, they smell death. Paul's life vested for what? Death. What a waste. What a waste of existence. What a waste of time. What a waste. The Corinthians were now beginning to smell the stench. And they're turning the tables on Paul. And the accusations now are being hurled. But what does Paul say? I'm always triumphing. Go to Romans chapter 8. Paul says something here. Romans chapter 8. Here's the thing that the world just doesn't get. By the way, here's the thing that many babes in Christ just doesn't get. The victory, the triumph, and the conquest is in the death. See what Paul's trying to say? You don't like the way I'm smelling anymore, huh? You don't understand. You're smelling the stench. You know what God smells? Refreshing, sweet, fragrant. The conquest is in the dying. Here in Romans chapter 8, look at what Paul says there, beginning at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril... Or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Notice, it does not say, in spite of all these things, we are more than conquerors. He does not say in the absence of all these things, we're more than conquerors. He never says in deliverance from all these things, we're more than conquerors. Where does Paul function as more than a conqueror? In it. Let me ask you a question. Conversely, can you be more? Can you be more than a conqueror without these things? You see what Paul's saying here? How can you be more than a conqueror if your life is devoted to avoiding all of this? Listen, the triumph and the conquest never comes because your life is nothing but happiness and unbroken comfort. And and you're situated and you're established and you've got a beautiful home, a beautiful family, a beautiful house, a beautiful career, a beautiful... You're not a conqueror. You can't be more than I can never function as a conqueror unless I'm where in these things. I hope you understand the difference here. The problem with so many of us is we want to be a conqueror for Jesus Christ. But man, I I don't want to touch any of this stuff. You're never going to experience the triumph. You're never going to experience conquest. Now, this is. You notice in verse 35, when Paul says, as it is written, why does Paul want to take us back to Psalms 44? Go to Psalms chapter 44. Paul now, now by, by, by the way, he says, as, okay, not for it is written, but when he says, as is, you know what Paul's saying is, listen, if you Romans, if you and I, members of the church, of the body of Christ, want to fully grasp and understand how it is that in the personal anxieties, in the economic hardships, in social rejection, in governmental persecution, you're a victor. You are a conqueror. You know, you know, the only way we're going to understand it, let's go to Psalms 44 and learn a little bit of history, okay? Now, the more I read Psalms 44, it is just, uh, wow. 
let's understand, there are two applications here in Psalms 44. There's an historic application and there's a prophetic application, okay? Historically, the armies of Israel are expressing a loud and bitter complaint. Have you ever complained to God about your life? My life stinks. <laughs> How come things just don't seem to go the way I would like? Why do things just seem to be unraveling and falling apart and making no sense and topsy-turvy and inside out? Hey, here are a group of people. They are expressing and registering loud and bitter complaint to God. Now, that's historic, the armies, but this is also prophetic of the little flock, okay, during the 70th week of Daniel. And in light of what's happening here, uh, look there at verse 9 of Psalms 44, but thou hast cast us off and put us to shame and goeth not forth with our armies. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy, and they which hate us spoil for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat, and hast scattered us among the heathen. So here in verses 9 through verse 16, you have the armies of Israel registering their complaint. Again, prophetically, this is what the little flock is going to do during the intense calamities and, 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 and uh, a catastrophic suffering that is going to be experienced, okay? They're going to complain to God. In light of this complaint, drop down to verse 17. You know, you know what's going to happen beginning in verse 17? The one who is complaining... Why are you doing this? Why is life an absolute mess? They're now going to tell God, listen, we've been faithful to you. Verse 17. All this has come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee? Neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. You see what the, the one who's registering the complaint my life's a mess. The armies, by the way, they're losing the battle. The Gentiles are invading and they're conquering and they're spoiling Israel. And, and, and these soldiers are thinking, what's going on here? And now they're challenging God. And they're actually saying, listen, you're not going to find us breaking the covenant. You're not going to find us worshiping those idols. Verse 17, listen, we haven't forgotten you. Look at verse 18. Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from thy way. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. Look at verse 20. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. You know what they're saying? Rip my heart open. And find in me any impurity, any uncleanness, any infidelity. What a challenge, right? God, we've done nothing wrong. That's what they're saying. And I dare you, Lord, search me out. And you tell me if you find anything that even remotely resembles unfaithfulness on our part. Now look at verse 22, which is the passage Paul is quoting in Romans chapter 8. Yea, for thy, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You know, all of the calamity and the catastrophe and all of the, the breakdown, it's not due to their unfaithfulness. It's not due to their turning away from God. It isn't due to their worship of God. It isn't due to it. they've done nothing wrong. But you know what they understand? Listen, it's because they are faithful that they're accounted as sheep for what? So the world looks at you and looks at me and you're nothing but sheeple. Bunch of religious dodo birds following some superstitious ignoramus claim of some guy who died and he rose from the dead. Ho, ho, ho. What an, you know, come on. You want to live your life for a dead God? 
The problem isn't because you've done. Paul is trying to tell us in Romans 8. Calamity and catastrophe is never due to a believer's unfaithfulness. It's due to his faithfulness. You want to smell bad to the world? It's okay. You want to be, listen, is there anything wrong with being the putrid stench of death in the nostrils of the world? Who cares? Who cares? What is it that God smells? Go to go to Ephesians chapter five. I, I want to talk about smelling good now. OK, listen, just understand what Paul is saying to the Corinthians is you guys are starting to smell the stink. And listen, it's in my death for you. Death to my ambitions, death to my aspirations, death to my rights, my wants, my wishes, my service is a testimony of death. So that the life of Christ might also be made manifest where? In me. You see, I don't care if the world thinks I smell. God, he smells the sweet fragrance in Ephesians chapter five. How do we smell sweet to God here in Ephesians chapter five, verse one, Ephesians chapter five, verse one. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Love. You know, you know what love is going to compel the believer to do. You know what love compelled Paul to do? Uh, the Corinthians didn't appreciate it. I understand that. Go back to uh, second Corinthians uh, chapter. Now, I'll tell you what. No, don't don't do that. We're not going to do that. OK, just because time is running out. Love. True love, a deliberate, conscious, willful choice to do what? As Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling what savor. The Corinthians, they just didn't appreciate that is exactly what Paul is doing. Paul is demonstrating his love. Keep your finger here. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Sadly, the Corinthians, they, they just were missing what Paul's ministry was all about. Notice, by the way, in verse 16, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. To the one we are, the savor of death unto death. Hey, you know what? If your neighbor smells garbage emitting from your house, if, if your employer smells garbage emitting from your workplace, if your teacher smells garbage emitting from your desk, if your relatives smell garbage at the dining room table. Okay. What does God smell? That's, that's the issue. Look at what the question he asks in verse 16. And who is sufficient for these things? Now, what is our knee-jerk answer to that question? Who is sufficient for all of this? We sort of immediately say, well, no one. Paul is, Paul is implying he is sufficient. Now, now, think about this for just a second. When he's challenging the Corinthians and he says, who's sufficient to do this? I am. I am sufficient. Verse 17 for we, see that? He's going to answer that question. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Listen, there are these sh uh, charlatans. There are these counterfeits that have infiltrated the, the assembly there at Corinth. And they are misleading these saints to, to uh, reject Paul because they have their own deceitful agenda. So Paul says, who's sufficient for all of this? He's implying, I am. Now, it's not self-generated sufficiency. Look there at chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency of, is what? See, when Paul says, who's sufficient? He is saying, I am. Why? Because God is my sufficiency. 
And what Paul is going to do, go to chapter 12. Uh, What Paul wants to emphasize is, listen, what I am doing in your midst is an act of love. Remember, uh, be ye followers of God as dear children. And and Paul's going to say in Ephesians 5, and listen, walk in love, okay? And there is a standard as Christ loved us. Remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and by the four times in this epistle, he's going to stress, I love you people. I love you people. You think I'm deaf. You think I stink. But you don't understand it. If you would smell what I'm doing the way God smells me, you would smell the, uh, the sweetness of my sacrificial, selfless life on your behalf. In chapter 12, look there at verse 15. I mean, can it be said any better than this? And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more I abundantly love you, less I be loved. Hey, you ask those clowns, you ask those frauds, if they would tolerate your insolence and your abuse and your rege- You see, you know what those money makers would do if they were treated the way the Corinthians treated Paul? They would drop them like a hot potato. You know what Paul says? Why am I persistently there for you people? Why am I the one suffering? For- those guys wouldn't suffer for you. You know why? Because religion, they don't give religion takes if a man smite you on the face as if a man take of you and paul is saying listen i'm not taking anything in fact i'm expending my soul for you people and the more i love you the less i be what paul says i always triumph corinthians it might be a stinky life but i'm always going to be the victor how is that In Ephesians chapter 5, there are three characteristics in being a sweet-smelling savor unto God, okay? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, and walk in love. That's what Paul's doing, as Christ also loved us. That's what Paul's doing for the Corinthians. And those ingrates, those ingrates, they're actually rejecting him instead of valuing what he's doing. And hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Question, what drove Christ to the cross of Calvary? There are three things. There are three marks of a sweet a sweet-smelling Savior. Go to Leviticus chapter 1. Just, just go to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1, this whole concept of a sweet-smelling savor. Interesting, it begins right here. Well, I shouldn't say it begins, but the book of Leviticus begins with the very concept of what a sweet-smelling savor is, okay? In Leviticus chapter 1, uh, let's start right there. Verse 1, Leviticus 1, 1, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake on him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. Please note, they were not allowed to select a wild animal. You know why? They already belong to God. Just see what God's saying here. Listen, you, you want to provide a burnt offering? Don't you dare go into the backyard and grab an animal. It already belongs to me. You know what God's expecting? It has to come from your own personal inventory. In other words, you're going to have to suffer loss. It's going to have to cost you. Keep your finger here. Second Samuel chapter 24. Here's a great illustration of King David. You remember King David in Second Samuel chapter 24? Second Samuel chapter 24, I, I know, keep your finger in Leviticus 1. I, we need to go back there just to learn something about this sweet-smelling savor. In, w- listen, God, it is not a sacrifice. It certainly doesn't a sweet aroma unless it's going to cost you something. King David understood that concept in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. And the king said unto uh, Arana, nay, 
but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. You know, I mean, the guy was, the, anyway, David wanted to offer sacrifice. He didn't have the animal. He didn't have a spot to do it. And so this guy says, hey, just go ahead and use my animals. Go ahead and use my, my ground. And you know what King David said? Absolutely not. David says, what I'm going to offer unto the Lord is going to be a willing, voluntary, free will sacrifice. And it's going to cost me something. I appreciate your kindness. But it cost David what? Uh, 50 shekels of silver. Okay. So go back to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. So when right off the bat in verse 2, when the Lord says, it's going to be of the cattle, of the herd, and of the flock. It's going to be taken from your possession. Don't take it from mine. Verse 3 of Leviticus chapter 1. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. It He shall offer it of his, here we go, own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement. Drop down to verse eight. And the priest, Aaron's son, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall be washed. How? You notice that the inner, the guts have to be what? Washed. The inside has to be washed, right? Now listen, the outside is going to be what? It's going to be uh, overdone, cooked. It's going to be burnt. But God uses this typology. He says, but I want the inside to be what? Washed. What does that typify? You see what God, God you, we need to be clean. Not, he's not talking to us, body of Christ. The inside has to be clean and satisfied. Verse 9, but, but his inwards and his legs shall be washed in water, and the priest shall burn, how much? All upon the altar to be a burnt sacrifice. Notice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. There are three characteristics that I think we can recognize. The Lord Jesus Christ, number one. He offered himself up as an acceptable, sweet, smelling savor because he offered himself up, number one, by faith. Number two, he did it freely. And number three, he did it fully. It was everything. It truly was all. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. When, what drove the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross to provide himself as that sweet smelling sacrifice to his heavenly father. You know that faith drove Christ to the cross of Calvary. And, and we learn that obviously here in Hebrews chapter 10. Look there at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. Wherefore when he cometh into the world he saith sacrifice. An offering thou wouldst not. Incredible the Lord's demanding Animals be slain. Animal blood be shed. And yet you have God saying, that's not what I want. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. All of the animals, all of the endless blood. Did it please God? No. But look at verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Number one, if your life wants to be a sweet fragrance to God, a perfumed scent, it has to be done by faith. Okay. Number two, real quickly. Number two, it has to be freely given. Go to John chapter 10. This is how the Lord Jesus did it. John chapter 10. And give me just another minute. We're going to tie it all together. I hope I promise. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And notice there in verse 17. John chapter 10 verse 17. John 10 verse 17. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me but I lay it down 
myself. The father would never, never violate the free will choice that his son made. Okay? God did not force his son to do what he did. Okay? The Lord Jesus, he's really clear about that. He says, I lay down my life that I might take it. Verse 18, no man take it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. You under, do you see the free will concept here? Listen, he did it by faith. I, it's in the volume of the book, it's written to me, I come, Lord, I delight to do thy will. I'm going to do it by faith. Remember what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2? He was obedient unto death. Even, he did it how? By faith. But he also did it freely as an act of his independent volition. God respects your free will, and he respected the free will decision that his son made. Okay? But then thirdly, How, what was the cost? Go to Isaiah chapter 53. This says it, this describes the type. When Leviticus says, you're going to burn how much of that animal? All of it. Don't hold back. I want everything burnt to a crisp. Completely consumed. Completely. That's complete, total dedication. Everything. Everything. Isaiah chapter 53. Did Jesus Christ give his all? You know, above and beyond. Remember, what does it say there in Isaiah chapter 53? Look there at verse 10. Yet it pleases the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Verse uh, 11. He shall see the travail of his soul. Verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his what? His soul, Jesus gave us all, body, soul. And by the way, into thy spirit, uh, into thy hands, I commend what? My spirit. God, Jesus had the right to decide whether or not I'm going to give my body. Jesus had the right to decide whether I'm going to pour out my soul. And Jesus was the one in total, complete command. I'm the one that's going to commend my spirit to who? Jesus, he gave his soul. Oh, now let's close here in Romans chapter 12. All right, don't worry about the world. Yeah, here comes that stinky Alex, my neighbor, you know, and here comes that stench. Hey, going around preaching about some stupid fairy tale. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus loves me. Yeah, right, 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 right. Okay. And okay, what do they say? What, Alex, you, you really would... You know, some of you, you listen, a lot of, I know guys that they've sacrificed quite a bit because of the ministry. And the world might interpret it as, what a fool, what a fool. You know, you could have been this. You could have done that. I could tell you stories about, but you, you could have done all sorts of things. And you now would just reduce your potential and opportunity to preach a myth. If Jesus gave faithfully, if our Lord Savior, he gave freely and he gave his all, right? What does Romans chapter 12, verse 1 teach? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy that ye present. What does that, when, when the verse says present, and when it says present it because you're motivated, I beseech you. Remember what Paul says to Philemon, listen, I could have enjoined, I could have commanded thee, but I would rather by love beseech you you and i can be a sweet smell a sweet smelling sacrifice number one give it freely right present your uh i I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies that ye present your bodies a what living sacrifice the burnt offering concept you give half of it you give most of it or do you give all of it holy and acceptable my god which is your That's faith. You see the three marks of a sweet smelling sacrifice in that verse. Do it by faith. You do it freely, not out of compulsion. And you do it fully. And God is the one 
who smells the perfume. Father, we thank you for your love, your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, that, that even though the world might interpret our life, ministry, message, the message that you've given us as nothing but stench and death, we thank you, Lord, that what you smell is a sweet-smelling savor. May we live in light of that truth, and may it encourage us, may it, uh, may it motivate us to live as more than conquerors in all of those adversities and in all of the inconveniences and in all of the discomforts of life. Uh, we thank you for that privilege in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.